Gabriela Vasquez and along with my team members, Daniel Hirando and Jennifer Arguela, we are BUG, Breaking Underground, and today we're presenting the inspection device for the Department of Energy Hanford Site Underground Tanks. Retrieval of radioactive material produces vast quantities of high-level waste. This high-level waste is stored in double-shell tanks that consist of a primary tank that rests on a refractory pad that has refractory slots that act as cooling channels, all within a secondary tank. In August of 2011, waste material, as seen in the bottom figure, was found in the annulus between the primary and secondary tank. The origin is believed to be a break in the primary tank, and this waste is traveling through the cooling channels into the annulus. Our motivation, first and foremost, is environmental impact. Leakage of this material to the subsurface soil can continue into the Columbia River that's located five miles from the Hanford tank, and this can severely affect the ecosystem as well as the communities that use this uh, water as a source. Our second um, motivation is that it's globally applicable. 56 million gallons of waste are created worldwide each year, and so this waste must be stored in repositories, and this re repository requires periodic uh, inspection for, um, for leakage. And finally, our objective is to develop an inspection tool that will travel through these cooling channels and we'll provide site engineers video feedback of the primary tank conditions so that they can um, identify the source and in the future repair. The design parameters of our design include that the, these devices can be deployed through the risers to the analyst flow. Also, it could fit through 1.5 by 1.5 inch channels, as shown in the above figure. Um, also, it must be able to navigate through four high degree turns. Um, as shown, like, this is the, the path that it would take and would be four high degree also, this device must be a remote control, provide video feedback, radiation tolerance of up to 85 radians per hour. Um, it needs to be withstand um, high temperature of uh, up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as um, it, the device must not subject the walls to more than 200 psi, the refractory pad walls. Um, also, the device will contain a tether for means of retrieval. In years I have side contracted companies such as Arriva, Vista Engineering, and AHI Southwest uh, Technologies to develop this um, inspection tool. However, um, the, the design that they were developed could not travel through vents, were of high cost, and did not protect their factory path because of this hand side did not continue to support <coughs> the company's efforts. Our proposed design container vacuum plate that will be attached to the top of the frame and will be attached to the uh, bottom of the carbon steel tank. Um, it would not destroy the refractory pad since it would not touch it as the same here. Um, also, its small size allows for vents through the L. It will be 1.2 by 1.2 by 1.1 inch and 5 inch in height. Our inspection tank is divided into two major divisions. We have the mechanical and electrical. The mechanical is the most, uh, two most crucial components are the stainless steel frame and the magnetic plate. On the electrical, it's a plate rod tether, which will be used in the communication device between the lab view and the camera. We also have a power cable which connects the speed controller, which powers your electric motor. Now the speed controller um, provides smooth and variable uh, variation of speed for the motor. It prevents the jerking mostly seen on the servos. Our cost, as you can see, uh, the majority of the cost is on the electrical side. This is due to the fact that the camera is susceptible to such large, uh, such harsh conditions. Uh, our total cost is 10500 Our camera is 7000 which is close to 70% of our total cost. Now, countries are working with many research companies uh, in a combined effort to develop radiation tolerant robotic devices. Uh, this research, along with products that, such as the one that Jennifer mentioned, uh, will be used as a reference for our device. We'll be using a 12 volt um, DC power supply connected to, uh, uh, well, with a rectifier with a connection for 110 and 240, which are the, the standard uh, voltages worldwide. Our assignments were systematically broken down, so our strengths can be. Uh, used in this project as well as divided the work equally and um, our timeline has been followed very rigorously. As you can see uh, during the summer we'll be doing FDA analysis as well as our first prototype de uh, development and prototype testing which will follow up into uh, fall of 2014. And so as Danny mentioned as we continue forward with our de design um, validation and our testing uh, it is our obligation to treat and store this legacy waste for future uh, generations uh, to provide them a safe environment and so we hope that bugs inspection device will allow the Department of Energy to inspect these tanks to prevent leakage. 
We'd like to thank the Department of Energy and the FIU DOE Workforce Development Program for their support and our mentors and advisors, Dr. Basil, Dr. McDaniel, Mr. Washenfelder, and Mr. Probonik, and Dr. Lagos. Thank you. Steel? There's, there's no stainless steel involved? No, in carbon steel. Anywhere? All of them are carbon steel. So your magnet will work? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so the trick will be to our try to overpower the magnet <clears throat> without pulling it off the, yes. the, the yeah. bottom of the tank. Exactly. Well, that, that's a great project because uh, my PhD dissertation was on that. I did the UST immobilization of the waste on that. Uh, and I wasn't aware of the I mean, I've been up there and everything, but um, you know, you have any idea of what speed you're going to be moving at? Well, the speed is not um, crucial as long as it's able to to go through all the bends and stuff. The reason is because um, with the motor is so small, our our device has to be like the motor has to be able to fit into that. So we're not worried about speed right now; it's just about the torque developed to be able to uh, move the the, okay. the device. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the simulations that you'll do? So how are you going to try to simulate the force of the magnet versus okay, so, the Okay, so, I'm sorry, were you explaining it? Well, so, of course, if you have an overpowered magnet, right, yeah. you can't move along the top. We'll be using yeah. the Abacus software uh, okay. to create a finite element analysis. Essentially, um, using the different weights and different magnet strengths, we will do uh, just a, a, first we'll do a 2D simulation to ensure that it will be able to travel forward and then from there build and, um, and do the, the actual 3D model. But essentially we will do a finite element analysis to with the different weights, different magnet strengths um, to ensure that it can move. And we'll, we'll find a balance where, because it, because there, there, it is crawling, essentially not slipping, we, need, we do need that, that traction. We do want to slightly overpower because of corrosion and stuff. Sorry. Right. Sure. But yeah, just be careful with that in No, I mean, that was my question about the corrosion. Once you get to a point yeah, there where your magnetic uh, effects are going to be minimized or something by, by, by some uh, uh, powder or whatever, you know, whatever's stuck on there, like, you know, the, the chemicals on it. Right. We um, have several different plates, all the different, um, you know, they'll be corroded at different um, layers. Yeah, at different layers. And so then we'll run tests through, uh, through those. The and the liquids in there is very caustic. I mean, that stuff is like very low, very high pH. So I think if you you, you got to consider chemically treating that that equipment as well. So in case you do touch one of those uh, leaks, you're not going to damage your product. Exactly. That's why we mentioned um, a lot of the things have to be custom manufactured, like the camera, which is why we have such a high cost. Uh, two questions. One, I would I'd make the assumption that there is some level of corrosiveness in the standard piping all the way through uh, until you get to the first location get this big leak. Is this magnetic concept going to be interfered with by some level of imperfection on that surface uh, as you start sliding this piece in? We're actually assuming initially, um, very, we're actually taking it to, um, as if there's no uh, type of imperfection initially, just to see if it's if it's uh, feasible first, and then we'll start implementing different type of, um, you know, because of the corrosion and stuff, it, it, it is going to have some type of uh, friction of, what do you call that? Well, there is going to be some type of restriction for it to move. And also, there are 72 entry slots. Um, I know the picture, for some reason, was a little, um, was blocked off halfway. But essentially, the refractory slots, there's 72 entry points all around. And so if for some reason one specific area is extremely corroded, there's another section that we'll be able to enter through. Our focus is essentially um, going down towards the center of the tank to see um, to see if there's leakage. Okay. The second question I have, you said that you have to, be, you have to go around four 90-degree bends? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just as worried about you getting there as I am coming back. <laughs> okay. Are you going to leave the system in in there forever? No. Uh, how um, are you going to pull a tether that's that's basically constrained at four different locations? We actually there uh, for the Department of Energy when we met with the WRPS um, engineers, they said actually their biggest focus is first to get within the first section. So within that first. Um, that first layer. So they would actually, a, a lot of the devices that were mentioned earlier did not even travel through. 
So um, obviously our first focus for them is to make it within that second, that first section, and then we'll navigate, because that already covers a good percentage of the tank, of the refractory pad. And so from there in getting back, we will program it so that it can travel backwards as well. And that's why also we have the refractory pad is actually a friable, it breaks apart easily. And so in the case that it does malfunction, you would be able to pull it back. Yes, you'll destroy the refractory pad, but at that point you'll already know that there's leakage in that area, and so you'll know that repairs will be required regardless. Also, we, we would have to add in the feather some um, type of mechanism that could uh, trouble the feather through more smoothly, maybe wheels that could uh, trouble through the shafts, and then coming back it would facilitate instead of destroying the refractory pad, it could facilitate the travel to the back, as well as forward. Um, so these wheels will be attached to the feather throughout and also magnetic to the top. So we are working on that design. But and, our focus and the is feather will have something in it to exactly. make sure that it's strong enough to can pull this whole system. Well, the tether will be very, very light. It's simply a fiber optic line and the power cable for the motors and for the camera. And fiber so um, it, uh, essentially it'll just, um, it's only for those, it's not necessarily something that's huge that will weigh down on this device. So, I would suggest you put a cable in there too, so that you've got the ability to pull the system back out if you need. Yes. Because if you, if for some reason you uh, pull too hard and you snap that power line, it's going to be there forever. Right, it will be jacketed together so um, to make it a little bit uh, stronger, and so that is our, our focus that that tether will allow for. Uh, in case of malfunction, whether it gets stuck or whatever that we, uh, or it stops working, we'll be able to pull it back. Maybe another question. 